So why, well, well okay, well, well, we'll come to the electronic side, but why are we doing this? Uh, the goal of this class is to teach you to design circuits, to do science. So many of you are physics majors, some of you are more biochemistry oriented. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but almost all the instruments you use are electronic in some form. So the goal is always to, to, to do some experiment, to make some measurement, and get that data into, into a form that you can analyze. And that almost always involves some delicate analog electronics to, to turn whatever you're measuring into a signal and some digital electronics to get it into your computer. And that's, that's what we're gonna do. So what separates this class from, from an engineering electronics class uh, is, is maybe a little bit surprising. I would say that here more than, than other classes, we're really gonna focus on designing and understanding at a gut level circuits. We're not gonna spend a lot of time analyzing circuits in great detail. I'm never gonna hand you a totally random looking circuit with a bunch of random components all connected in some crazy way and say, write down all the equations and do a careful analysis of that. That's not what this, this class is about. It's, it's about um, you know, understanding how to design building blocks and put the building blocks together and really understand intuitively how, how the building blocks work and how they fit together. So um, you know, a, big, a big part of that, and, and in today's, today's lecture, it might be review for, for a lot of you who've taken uh, you know, one of the engineering classes or electromagnetics class. There's nothing, there's no new concept. Uh, maybe you don't remember everything and that's totally fine. It'll be, it'll be a good review. But for, for the rest of you, I hope it'll sort of motivate maybe a little bit of a different way of thinking about things. And I would say the first thing is that's going to be different about this class than, than in some of the other classes. We're really going to focus on approximations and uh, more intuitive level understanding. And I would say, especially in the beginning of this class, a lot of people feel really uncomfortable with the extreme level of approximating that we do. And, and the goal is, is really, it's a, it's a skill that, that I want you to develop because the goal is really to look at a circuit and be able to very quickly just say, okay, this is about this, this is about that, this component really matters, this one doesn't. Um, and after a few minutes, you can understand what it does without saying, oh my God, there's a, a circuit I need to write down a whole bunch of equations and solve a bunch of equations. And if you change something, it'll be another hour before I can tell you what it did, what it did because I need to write down all the equations and you know, either analyze them all by hand or enter them into some computer and simulate it and it's gonna take forever, I can't, I can't go on. If you really wanna design the next circuit, you, you can't just start by plunking down random components and analyzing what happens. You need to understand intuitively what happens and you need to understand intuitively you know, how, how big should these components be, which components really matter, which don't matter, which components can I make 10 times bigger or 10 times smaller uh, without really affecting the circuit and which components do I have to really worry about. So that's kind of the, the first motivation for the extreme level of approximations that we'll be doing. Uh, another, another reason is that resistors and capacitors and other components, they're really only good to about 10%. So uh, I, I sp spent a little bit of extra money and I got you resistor kits that are probably good to 1% uh, just because they came in nice labeled bags. But in general, if you pick up a random resistor in a random electronics lab, the, they're only specified to 5% five, 5 and the capacitors you have are probably only good accurate to 10%. And as the temperature changes, uh, those resistance values and capacitors are gonna change. Um, as they age, it's gonna change. Uh, and so you need to design your circuits with, with that in mind and, and really obsessing over the accuracy uh, beyond that is, is not very useful until maybe much later when we really design circuits that are meant to be accurate. And there, there's actually special techniques to get accurate circuits. It's not a matter of buying more expensive components that are more accurate. It's a matter of finding components that are maybe matched to each other and only looking at ratios. So that if the components heat up, they, they change together, but the ratio doesn't change, so, something like that. Now the real world is, is messy. Even if you measure these resistors to, to three decimal points using a, a meter that's calibrated by the National Institute of Standards, you know, things are gonna drift with, with time and humidity and, and age. Um, and moreover, a resistor isn't just a resistance. It doesn't act like purely an ideal resistor does. There are wires sticking off the ends of the resistor. 
And uh, as you learned in E&M, any, any wire has a magnetic field around it and anything with a changing magnetic field acts like an inductor. And so all resistors secretly have inductors sticking off each end. Uh, you're gonna put the resistor next to other resistors. And whenever you have wires next to other wires, there's metal near other metal. And uh, you know, as you learned in E&M, whenever there's metal near other metal, that makes a capacitance. So there are secretly capacitances everywhere. And so once you start getting to the 1%, tenth of a percent, uh, or, or once you start going uh, really fast in circuits, all of these inductances and capacitances matter and make an ideal resistor not act very much like an ideal resistor. And in those special cases, you have to start worrying about it. But you know, there are many, many more examples of this kind of thing over and over again in every component. And so if we wanna start worrying about things to 1%, we're, we're gonna to have to start worrying about a lot more than we're worrying about. So the first pass through electronics, especially in the first half of this class, we're really just gonna take a 10% kind of point of view. The components are accurate to about 10%. Um, you can do calculations in your head to 10%, you know, that's like one significant figure. And so we're, we're gonna kind of go, uh, go pretty fast and loose with the approximations. And that's, that's really a skill that I want you all to develop, not something that you should feel we're, we're slacking on. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, the difference between current and voltage and power and resistance. And I wanna give you a, an intuitive picture. You know, there are mathematical definitions that we can write down, but you know, again, the point of this class is to develop some, some intuition for these things. So I'm gonna approach it from that, that perspective. All right, so, so let me say a couple of words about uh, how we like to think of current and voltage and resistance and power. And these are all things you encountered in, in E&M and in STEMS, but you know, maybe I'll, I'll take a slightly different, different take on it in this class. So, so current, current is probably the easiest thing to think about. Right, it's just some, some number of electrons flowing past some point every second, right? So in this class, especially in the beginning when we want intuitive pictures for things, you can think of current as just the flow of water through a pipe. And you know, the, the more water flows through the pipe, the bigger the current. And there, there are a couple caveats here and it. You know, Bender and Franklin famously got the sign of the current carrier wrong. You know, he, he didn't know, he just guessed randomly and he assigned uh, one thing positive and one thing negative, and turned out it would have been much more convenient for everyone if he had gone the other way. And so, you know, all of the charges that move around in these circuits uh, are, are electrons, negatively charged, you know, until, until we get to certain transistors and diodes, but we're not going to worry about that too much. Um, all the charges that move around are, are really negative, but we're always going to think about in terms of what's called conventional current, positive charges moving in the direction opposite the electrons. So I, I will almost never worry about the direction of flow of electrons. I'll always just talk about current as if it's positive charges moving up. And everything, everything works out exactly the same if you think about it that way. Uh, you know, and the, we use coulombs and, and amperes and for the circuits that we're designing, there's a macroscopic number of, of electrons moving around, you know, 10 to the 19 for an amp of current, uh, 10 to the 16 electrons moving around per second for, for the kinds of stuff we'll, we'll be working with. But typical values of current, I would say, are, are, uh, are sort of the one milliamp for this class. So, so today, you're, you're gonna be working with batteries and light bulbs and motors, and the current's gonna be higher than this. But after today, if, if you're dealing with currents that are more than one milliamp, something's probably fishy about your circuit. Either you did something wrong or we're specifically dealing with something that needs a lot of power like a light bulb or a motor. So you know, just for this class, the, the typical currents are about a milliamp. All right, so, so voltage, voltage I would say is much less intuitive than current. Um, from, from electromagnetism, you can remember that voltage is, uh, is the, uh, well, the potential energy of a particular charge is related to the, the charge and the voltage. So this is the, the kind of thing that defines voltage. Now all of our charges are all the same, right? They're all 
electrons. So you can basically think of voltage as just potential energy. And the analogy that we really like to use in this class is that the potential energy, um, well, potential energy in, in mechanics, say of, uh, of an object that's raised at, to some height is MGH, right? And so uh, as, I, as I raise this marker higher and higher and higher, I'm giving it more and more potential energy. And then if I let it go, it will release that potential energy and turn it into first kinetic energy and then into heat when it, when it hits the, the bottom. And this is a great analogy because um, you can think of the, the height of this marker as just a measure of its gravitational potential energy. And, and these constants kind of come along for the ride and don't, don't really matter much if we're just thinking intuitively. And same thing here. Uh, I'm going to talk about voltage as, as a height of water in our, in our water analogy. So, so you can think of a battery or a power supply as a pump that pumps water from one level up. It gives it, it, gives it height. It gives it potential energy. And then that water is going to flow through your circuit back down to ground level. And uh, a lot of the circuit components will think about, okay, what, how do they affect that flow? Uh, a lot, yeah, I'll try to put everything in terms of those, those, those terms. And I would say that this, this affects how we draw circuits. So it, it, it helps to design circuits by keeping this analogy in mind. So for example, we can have a battery, you have a plus and a minus, and we're almost always going to draw positive fixed voltages as high, physically higher on the circuit than, than negative voltages. So you can imagine uh, a battery that's, that's pumping water up to some height. And often our circuits have what are called rails here. So just long wires that are all at the same, same voltage because they're all uh, connected by some conductor. Uh, and we're going to draw them all at the same height. And then you can hang things off of them, like, like a light bulb, say. And you can hang other things, like a, maybe a pair of light bulbs. Uh, you just hang things off of these rails. And it's easy to see, OK, this pump is going to pump things up to a certain potential. And then as they fall through these, um, these components, they're going to lose potential uh, and end up at, at the, the lowest potential to, to be pumped up again. So you can hang resistors, resistors in series. Um, that's what we'll, we'll think of voltage. So uh, in, in your head, uh, when I say voltage, and I, and I go around a circuit, I might say, this battery is going to bring the voltage up by some amount. And then uh, say here, this first light bulb is going to uh, drop the voltage by some, some amount, and this one is going to drop the voltage by some amount. So we'll really focus on this, this height, height analogy. So the height of, of water being pumped around a circuit. Um, so yeah, and, and just remember that all points on a conductor are the same voltage. So every from the top of this battery, any bit of this wire here is all at the same voltage. So. Uh, uh, that's, that's the important thing there. So, so let, me, let me just say current as a flow is much easier to think about. And so you might think that's, that's the thing that we, we build our circuits to manipulate. But in reality, uh, we build all of our circuits to manipulate voltages. The, the amplifiers, when we build amplifiers, they're going to amplify voltages. When we build logic circuits, the logic is not going to be current flowing or current not flowing. The logic is going to be voltage high versus voltage low. And you know, the question is, if, if it's so much easier to think about current intuitively than it is to think about this sort of more abstract potential energy business, why, why do we build all of our circuits to, to manipulate voltage? Um, and, and there's a couple answers to that. I'd say that the, the biggest answer is that batteries and solar panels and power supplies, they make voltages. Right? Your house wiring is 120 volts here in the US. Um, you, you get a AAA battery and it's 1.2 volts or 1.5 volts, depending on how, how charged it is. Uh, you, you plug something into USB and it's 5 volts, we make voltages. We don't make currents. Uh, 
uh, and, and it's easy to measure voltages. Uh, that's a big difference. When you measure current, you have to break this circuit and insert a, a current meter here. And that's one, it's kind of a pain if, if you just wanna go from place to place to place and measure all the currents. You have to constantly be breaking the circuit and putting the current meter in and restarting the circuit. Often that means turning the circuit off, doing your manipulations and then turning it back on if, you, if you're worried that something's gonna go bad if you just pull a random wire. Uh, so it's much harder to measure current. And it's much easier to measure voltage. So if you just measure voltage, you just take your voltmeter here and uh, let me do it over here. So here's, here's your voltmeter. You can tie one end to this, this common rail down here. You could take the other end and imagine probing, probing the rail or probing in between. And you don't have to break the circuit to do any of these things. You, you just keep, keep one end of the voltmeter tied and you can just poke around uh, with the other one. And in fact, if you're, uh, if you're measuring something that varies as a function of time with our oscilloscope, you can, you can only measure voltages. There's, there's no real oscilloscopes that measure current unless you buy some special, specialized things that, that are pretty, pretty rare. You're almost always measuring voltages because it's, it's easy to do without disturbing the circuit. And, uh, and that's, that's what we make and manipulate. Now, the other thing is it's always safe to measure voltages. So it takes a lot, a really high voltage, you know, 1,000 volts usually to, to, to cause trouble with a voltmeter or an oscilloscope. Whereas with current, you have to be really careful. It's really easy to, to blow a fuse on your, on your meter when you're measuring current. It's really easy to accidentally uh, unplug this. And if you're not paying attention because you plug the wrong wire in, uh, instead of plugging it in here, if you plug your current meter here by accident, uh, suddenly an enormous amount of current can flow from this high potential down through the current meter. And then there the, the, uh, the fuse will blow. So uh, when you're measuring current, it's, it's much more, uh, it's not like unsafe for you necessarily, but it's much more easy to, to ruin your, your instruments. I have to change the fuse. I think, I think you might all have one extra fuse, but not, not more than one extra fuse. So we're, I'd say that after today, we, we, we're barely ever gonna measure current. It's all gonna be voltage, voltage, voltage. Uh, okay, so let me add, address another common mis, I don't know, misconception question that people have. What's the deal with ground? So all of our circuits are gonna have a ground, but what, what's going on with ground? Well, let's go back to our analogy here. When we're in mechanics, the, the potential energy was, was MGH, but height, height with respect to what? You know, you're, you're not always measuring height with respect to some absolute sea level, right? You're just measuring it with respect to the floor in your lab or wherever you happen to be. So the zero point of mechanical potential energy is, is arbitrary. You can set your, your H equals zero to be wherever you want. And the same thing with voltage. Really it's voltage differences that matter, not absolute voltages. And so you can set your zero point wherever you want. And usually we define a convenient point in the circuit, which is often, if, if there's a single, a single supply here, is often just the, the lowest point in the circuit. So we arbitrarily call this ground. We give it this, this symbol here. And, and that just means zero volts. And oftentimes I will say uh, the voltage at a particular point. So the voltage at this point or the voltage at that point or the voltage at that point. And that always means the voltage with respect to ground. So you take your, let me get a, so you can actually see, you take your meter and you measure, uh, you know, the, the black wire of your meter or the black wire of your, of your oscilloscope is always gonna be attached to the, the ground. And then you can probe around and measure the voltage at this point or at that point or at that point. Uh, so our, our first pass at, at ground, it's just sort of an arbitrary designation uh, to, to define our reference, just like you have to define your height equals zero reference. But, you know, there's, uh, well, let, let me say one more thing. Sometimes, sometimes we'll have dual supply circuits. So oftentimes we'll have, let's say this is a, a five volt power supply and we'll have 
another five volt power supply that comes down here. And so this, this point here is at five volts, but this point down here is gonna be at minus five volts with respect to ground, with respect to this arbitrary zero point. Uh, and, and this is useful for a lot of kind of amplifier circuits where you have small signals that, that are wiggling around zero volts. So this is how, how audio and how audio would work, for example. You have some small signal wiggling around zero volts, a little bit positive, a little bit negative, and you want to amplify it to be a big signal wiggling around zero volts. Uh, it's useful to have a, a split power supply like this. Uh, so, so here, ground is not the lowest point in the circuit. It's just still some arbitrary point that we designate as, as zero volts. Um, and, and here, you have to be a little bit careful about the, the height analogy. So this pump is certainly pumping things up from, from ground level to some height, but then it can dribble down through, through these various components. Um, what is this pump doing? Well, it's kind of like the sump pump in your basement. It's sucking water up from, from below ground level up to ground. And so, you know, if you had some, some light bulbs here, uh, they, would, they would still light up and the current would still flow that way. Or if you had some light bulb that, let me extend it over here, some light bulb that, uh, that went all the way from plus five to minus five, uh, the voltage across this light bulb would be 10, 10 volts here total. Uh, uh, so, you know, yeah, like I said, it's mostly for, for amplifiers. Now, now, there is one additional piece. Oftentimes, there, the reason why it's called ground and the reason why this is maybe a little bit confusing to people at first is in, in house wiring, there, there is actually a, a place in your house where there's a physical copper spike that's driven into the ground near where the power comes in. And that is connected to, certainly it's connected to the third prong in, in, your, in your outlets. And actually at the place where it enters your house, it's actually also connected to one of the other two, two wires. And so this is a little bit confusing. You know, what, what is the deal with the actual earth ground that's actually physically connected to ground ground? Well, that's mostly for safety. That's mostly because as you walk around or uh, as, you, as you get in your, your uh, bathtub, uh, you're connected to drainage pipes and copper pipes that supply the water. And those are all eventually connected to ground. And you want all of your, your electrical instruments to be, to be referenced with respect to ground so they're not floating up at some arbitrarily high, crazy voltage. So they're all some reasonable voltage with respect to ground. And there are special outlets, which you probably have in your kitchen and your bathroom with that little button. And what that does is it says, well, normally we want, we want the current to come in one of the flat. So here, let me draw a plug here. We want the current to come in one of these flat uh, connectors and come out the other flat connector. And nothing should ever go into this ground connector. But uh, if if there is some imbalance here, if the amount of current coming in one is not the same as the amount of current going out the other, then it must be going somewhere else, either to, to this plug, which would be bad, because often this plug is connected to the, the metal case of, of your instruments, the metal housing of, of, uh, uh, of, of your computer, say, uh, or it's going through you into the, the pipes. And so the little, uh, the little button on your on your outlet in your kitchen and your bathroom will, will come out. So it's called a ground fault uh, circuit interrupter. Uh, but you know the fact that physical ground actually exists and some of your wires are physically connected to ground is, is barely going to affect us in this class. Um, the only slight effect it has is that uh, the the, sh the shell of the USB connector is often connected to your computer case which is connected to your computer power supply, which is eventually connected to ground. And so unless you're operating purely on battery and you're, you're really hovering, hovering everything away from, from everywhere else, um, every USB thing you plug in, the, the outer shell of that USB is gonna be connected to physical earth ground. And so uh, particularly what that means is that if you have two of these things, even if they're on different computers, 
they're actually electrically connected together through the house wiring. So you just have to keep in mind that all of the shells are, are physically connected together. And same thing with uh, real test equipment. So, so you, you have an oscilloscope and a power supply and a function generator that all plugs into USB. So you have to deal with the USB ground. But uh, if you had a, you know, a big lab power supply or a lab oscilloscope, all of the, the things you would plug into there with the, with the BNC cables, the things that you sort of plug in and twist, um, those, those have two conductors. There's an inner, inner conductor and an outer conductor. And the outer conductor is physically connected to the case and physically connected to ground. And that's mostly for safety and a little bit also for noise, noise isolation. So, uh, you know, there is, there is a physical spike connected to physical ground, but that, that doesn't affect us at all. It's ground for us is just this arbitrary zero volt point that, that, we, that we declare. Um, and feel free to interrupt with any questions. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I'm probably talking, saying the same thing over and over again more than I want to because no one's saying anything. Uh, so let me, let me erase this and, and now is your chance to ask questions. Oh, let me just point out, um, typical voltages in this class are gonna be you know, somewhere between one volt up to maybe 10 volts at most. We're not, we're not gonna get much higher than that. So uh, your, your power supplies can make plus five volts and minus five volts. And so the biggest voltage difference we're gonna deal with is 10 volts. Um, in a lab, you typically deal with, you know, maybe up to plus 20 and minus 20. You're never really dealing with house wiring at 120 volts or 240 volts, um, unless you're doing, you know, real power equipment. Not certainly not the kind of microelectronics that that we'll deal with and that that are typical for for physics instruments. And and this is kind of nice. This isn't. Uh, this actually comes from physics and chemistry, the fact that we deal with typically you know, one, one volt-ish type orders of magnitude here. And, and that just has to do with the fact that uh, like for a battery, the, the chemical transitions between the, the two states are typically around a volt or for lithium, it's four volts. Uh, so they're, they're all sort of or, order one volt. Um, if you have LEDs that emit light, each photon that comes off of an LED comes from some transition of, of some, uh, uh, some electron in the semiconductor. And those transitions are typically a volt or so. So one volt is the right order of magnitude for that. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is resistance. And uh, our analogy here is gonna be like a thin, a thin tube that uh, takes some some effort to push the water through. Or maybe you can think of uh, one of those carbon filters, like a pitcher where you pour the water in and it, it, it sits at some high potential and it, it eventually drains to some low potential. But along the way, it has to go through this copper water filter. So it's not, it's not gushing down. It's not gaining any kinetic energy. It's uh, slowly heating up that, that copper filter as, as the water drains down. Uh, and, and interestingly, carbon is also what a lot of our resistors are made of. And uh, today in lab, you'll, you'll make your own resistor by uh, writing with pencil. You'll, you'll just make a little rectangle of, of resistance with, with pencil, just fill it in really, really good and shiny. And you'll measure its resistance and you'll do some things with it. Uh, but when you do this, you should find that the resistance from, from the top to the bottom is some, somewhere around 10, 10 kilo ohms. Maybe, maybe it's a few times bigger, maybe it's a few times smaller, it depends on how big you made your rectangle and how, how well you filled it in. But uh, uh, that, that's, that's the sort of typical, typical resistance we'll deal with. So, so something, you know, 10, 10 kilo ohms is a good resistance. If you're gonna just arbitrarily pick a resistor because you wanna test something and need a resistor, uh, grab a 10 kilo ohm resistor. That's, that's pretty standard. So, so you can think of from the, the water analogy, let me, let me actually put a, a battery here. So it's magnitude plus and minus. 
And let's actually hook up this, this carbon resistor that you've drawn, you've drawn uh, on your piece of paper. Uh, so what happens? This, this is like a pump. It's pumping water up to a certain height. And then the, the charges here, you can think of them as sort of bouncing down uh, and the zigzagging down and hitting carbon atoms as they, as they slowly zigzag down. It'll build up any kinetic energy. They, they, they zigzag down and uh, exit the bottom here and then come back into the, the battery pump to be pumped back up to a, a certain height. And that's, that's where the resistance symbol comes from, is the sort of picture of charges kind of zigzagging around as, as they slowly make their way through. So I don't know if you, you've seen these uh, like pachinko machines or, or marble machines with, uh, with pegs where you, you drop a marble in and it, and it kind of hits the pegs and then bounces around. And there's a, a demonstration at the Boston Museum of Science about how every time this ball makes a binary choice, it either goes left or right, and then it has to make another binary choice, left or right, left or right. And uh, you drop in hundreds and hundreds of balls. And at the end, you get some, some nice distribution of, of balls. But uh, the, this is how you should think of resistant, resistors in this, in this water analogy. So, so let's, let's talk about Ohm's law for a second and how we think about Ohm's law in this class. So, you know, I, hopefully for many of you, this is, this is super easy review and, and maybe I'm giving you a slightly different perspective on, on how to think of these things, but uh, trust me in, in a couple of weeks, it'll, it'll go much faster. Um, so Ohm's law V equals IR, we'll use this over and over and over again. So what are the terms here? Well, this is, the voltage is, you know, this, this height uh, of the, of the, well, the potential or the height in the water analogy. I is the, the current that flows, how, how quickly the water is flowing. And resistance is this restriction on, uh, on the water flow. And usually, at least to start with, it's, it's nice to solve, solve the equation the other way because what we make and what we measure are voltages. So you can think of the, the cause of, as a voltage and the effect as a current. So certainly in this case, whatever, let's, let's call this one volt maybe. Um, uh, it, it makes sense to think of the battery causing the current. And so often, at least initially, it makes more sense to think about conductance one over R rather than resistance. I think intuitively conductance is much easier to think about. Big conductance means a big flow. Small conductance means a small flow. Uh, you know, pretty soon you'll, you'll get into the habit of thinking about resistances. So big resistance is a small flow. Small resistance means a big flow. So uh, uh, yeah, when you're thinking intuitively in circuits, that often makes sense. Uh, here's uh, hopefully a rhetorical question. What's, what's more dangerous to, to plug into an electrical outlet? Is it a, a plastic fork or a metal fork? Somebody say something so that I know you're alive. Metal fork. Metal fork, yeah, why? why? Uh, and a metal fork has a very low resistance, right? So oftentimes people think, oh, low resistance, that's, that's good. That's, you know, low resistance is good, high resistance is bad. Well, depends on what you want, but low resistance is more dangerous because a low resistance means much more current can flow. Uh, and uh, as, as a friend of mine, when I first taught this electronics lab class used to say, it's, you, you've got the, the whole force of the entire Hoover Dam pushing back against you and that uh, trying to force current through that fork. So, uh, so what this means is that low resistors Low resistances, low resistors are, are more dangerous than, than high resistors. So if you're going to grab some random resistor to try something, err on the side of grabbing one that's too big. So 10K, you're, you're not going to go wrong. But if you start grabbing 100 ohms, uh, you might end up with too much current and it might get hot and a bad thing might happen. So, uh, so there you go. So yeah, err on the side of, of high resistances. So. Um, let me talk about a potentiometer, which is, which is one of the things that, that we're gonna deal with in, in lab today. And you're gonna, you're gonna build one out of copper here. And uh, so a potentiometer is a, a three terminal device. And 
I, I'm not sure why this is, but a lot of people have, um, you know, they struggle with this a lot as, as, the, as the class proceeds. So um, you can imagine a potentiometer inside is just a strip of carbon like this. And then the third, so there's one, one metal terminal coming off the bottom, one metal terminal coming off the top. And then the third terminal is often drawn as an arrow here and you can slide it up and down. So you'll physically build one of these with your copper, but uh, in reality, you also have, have devices that look like, um, let me just draw what's inside to sort of look like this. And there's a wire coming out here, a wire coming out here, and a wire coming out the middle that's connected to some, some wiper that's, that's on a knob that when you turn the knob, this wiper can move back and forth. So if you measure the resistance between the outer two wires, it's like measuring the resistance of this long strip here. Uh, that's always going to be fixed no matter how you turn the knob. But if you measure the resistance between here and here, it's going to grow as you move, as you slide this up. And if you measure the distance between here and here, it's going to shrink as you slide this up. And same thing here. If you measure the distance between here and here, it's going to grow as you turn the knob clockwise. And if you measure the distance between here and here, it's going to shrink as you uh, turn the knob. Uh, but the sum, this resistance plus this resistance is always going to add up to the fixed total resistance. And so this is, uh, this is one of the devices that we'll play with today. Um, let me just say that this is by far the most damaged device. And since you have kits and we have to mail you stuff, uh, I can't just give you more very easily. So be careful with this. Why is this the most damaged device? Well, people often turn the knob all the way down to zero. And when you turn the knob down to zero, it's like sticking a fork in your, in your power supply. So unless, unless you construct the circuit to make that okay, because you have some other resistance in the way, uh, you have to be really careful about turning the knob all the way down to zero or turning the knob all the way down to zero the other way. And this happens more often than, than you might think just because people wire the circuit slightly wrong or do, do something slightly funny. Um, and the, and the, way to, the way to avoid that, uh, and you should start drilling this into your heads from the first day, is when you first pick one of these things up, make sure that the knob is sort of in the middle. And after you connect it into your circuit, you know, kind of turn the knob, but only a little bit. Keep it, keep it roughly in the middle. And that way you'll never get all the way down to some dangerously low resistance and you'll avoid the uh, fork in the electrical outlet phenomenon. All right, uh, let me talk about power next. I'll erase, I'll erase this stuff. Are there any questions about that? Can show you one of I can show you some of these components uh, after after I'm done. Let me keep let me keep those things up. Um, all right, so the power. You know the the batteries and power supplies make potential, and that potential has to go somewhere, and often it gets turned into heat. And the, the power, the, the heating power uh, is the current times the voltage. So a resistor is going to get hot when there's both current and voltage. So for a particular resistor, there, there can't be current without voltage because these are always proportional. But for other, other electrical components, there can be, you know, the relationship between current and voltage isn't just Ohm's law, it's something else. But the amount of power that, that gets dissipated is the product of the current and, and the voltage. So, uh, so you, need, you need both to make power. For, for, a resistor, for a resistor, we can plug in two different versions of this. I could either plug in for I or plug in for V. Um, if I plug in for V, this just becomes I squared R. And if I plug in for, for I here, uh, this becomes V squared over R. So if you're just controlling the voltage, 
the amount of power goes up like the square of the voltage. And here you can also see that for very small resistors, when you're putting a fixed voltage across them, very small resistors lead to a lot of power, a lot of heat. So that's why small resistors are dangerous. You know, if, if we had constant current power supplies, which we'll build one of in a few weeks, but they're, they're pretty unusual, then uh, the bigger the resistor, the, the, more, the more power would get dissipated in the resistor. But that's almost never the case. We almost always have a constant voltage that we're putting across our resistor. So again, small resistors are, are dangerous. So, you know, uh, the order of magnitude for power, if we have one volt and one milliamp, the order of magnitude of power is about one milliwatt. So we'll, we'll typically deal with pretty, pretty small power. Um, uh, what do I want to say here? Um, a, a resistor, the, the resistors in your kit are all resistors in kit are all quarter quarter watt resistors. So what that means is if you put more than a quarter of a watt into this resistor, it's going to heat up so much that it's going to damage the resistor. And probably even before that, it's going to get pretty hot and it might burn you. So you know, a quarter of a watt is is really big. We don't we don't we don't want to deal with a quarter of a watt in this class. Typical, typical uh, uh, Powers are, are milliwatts. All right, so you know, if we're talking about building a a thing that heats uh, a sample, or we're talking about a motor that needs to provide some power, uh, voltage and current look like they're on equal footing, but but we'll we'll be uh, manipulating the voltage, and the current's always going to come along for the ride. So uh, let, me, let me draw a version of that, sort of the, the current coming along for the ride. And the one circuit that we'll talk about a lot, and, and I want to give you the, the kind of physics electronics way of thinking about it, is, is what's called a voltage divider. So let me, let me get rid of basically everything and ask if, if people have questions about any of this stuff while I'm erasing. Voltage divider. So the way I like to think about this is uh, to really focus on, on the voltages and let, let the currents come along for the ride. So let me start back with my picture of my, my resistive strip here, my un, unfolded potentiometer. And let's imagine we put in 10 volts and we take take uh, a probe and probe along this strip. Now, as I, um, as I move this probe around, it will measure different voltages. And if we think about it in the water analogy, we've, uh, the battery or the power supply raises the, the potential of the water to a height of 10, 10 volts. And that the water is gonna fall down and get lower and lower and lower height, lower and lower and lower potential. And so as we slide this slider along, we can slide it from a very low potential. So this is gonna be zero volts here, maybe one volt here. You could slide it up exactly halfway. It's gonna be five volts. And all the way at the top, it's gonna to be 10 volts. And so we can divide this input voltage by any ratio we want by uh, picking the, the slider position. And, and I haven't said anything about current. But yes, there is some current that's flowing through this thing, but who cares? It's coming along for the ride. We're making voltages, we're measuring voltages. We'll focus on the, on the voltages primarily. Um, now, you can think about this equivalently as, uh, oh, let, me, let me draw this again, so plus minus, and volts here. Think about this as two different resistors and you're measuring the voltage out there. So let me call this R top and R bottom. And 
you can think about this pump pumping water up to 10 volts and having the water fall down. Uh, and now you can think about measuring the voltage. So, so if you're thinking about it in the, in the height analogy, if I were to start out here, let me just designate this as ground at zero volts. If you were to start out here and you were to go up by some, some voltage across this bottom resistor and then up by some other voltage across this top resistor, I end up at a height of 10 volts. So the voltage across this bottom resistor plus the voltage across this top resistor has to be 10 volts. And what is the voltage across a resistor? Well, of course, the voltage across a resistor, Ohm's law, V equals IR. So I could ask, well, what is the, what is the output here, V out? Well, I've, I've started out at zero volts and I've gone up by the voltage across the bottom resistor. So this is just I times R bottom. And what is I? Well, I don't ultimately care about I. I only care about uh, voltage. Oh, am I off the screen? Sorry. I'm going to say V out. V out is I times R bottom. Um, I don't. I don't care about current, but sometimes I need. I need to calculate it as an intermediate step, and I want to get rid of it as quickly as possible because we don't want to measure currents or or think about currents or manipulate currents. We want to think about voltages. But um, if I think about the current, well, where where can the water flow? Well, anything that flows up through the battery here has to flow down through this top resistor and down through this bottom resistor, and from all your uh, series is. <laughs> Uh, series and parallel things, we know that uh, if we do V equals IR for the, the sum here, uh, we get 10 volts. Uh, let, me, let me do it here to save space here. So 10 volts V, the total voltage, equals I times the total resistance, R top plus R bottom. So we can solve for I and plug it in here, and we get that this is, uh, let, me, uh, let me call this V in to be pretty general here. V out ends up being V in times the ratio of R, R bottom over R total our top plus our bottom. So it's just what fraction of the total resistance, um, what fraction of total resistance have I gone up to, to make this V out? So I think it's, it's really obvious to see where that connects to our, our, uh, our more intuitive picture here. What fraction of the total resistance uh, have I slid this slider up? What fraction of the way from, from ground up to 10 volts am I? Uh, so this is the way to sort of quickly think about voltage dividers. Uh, you know, yes, you can have current come along for the ride, but as soon as you so, soon as we can, we'll get we'll get rid of current in favor of voltages. And let me just say that uh, next time we'll talk about capacitors and filters and high pass and low pass filters. And high pass and low pass filters are best thought of as voltage dividers, where one of the resistances is dependent on frequency. So uh, it's, it helps to think about in the limits, okay, in the limit where our bottom is really tiny, V out doesn't go up very much. So where our bottom is really tiny compared to our top, V out is basically zero. And the limit where our bottom is way bigger than our top, you have to go almost all the way up. You, know, you, you go up a significant fraction of the way to the, the total resistance. So when our bottom is big compared to our top, V out is pretty much V in. And, and again, we'll think about three cases. One is uh, our bottom is really huge compared to our top. One is our bottom is really tiny compared to our top. And the third case is where they're about equal. Of course, where they're about equal, then our voltage divider predicts that we'll, we'll get about the same. So this is the kind of quick, quick approximations and limit cases that we'll take in this class. Um, I think, let me talk a little bit about diodes and LEDs. And there's some stuff about seven and equivalent circuits and input and output impedance, but I'll let 
I'll let you uh, I'll let you read about that in the, as you do the lab. So uh, let me let me erase this as I as I ask for questions. So let me just say, uh, it might not, you might be much more excited about amplifying voltages, but I will tell you that the first real amplifier, or the first high quality amplifier we're gonna make, the very first step of that amplifier is to divide the voltage. So these voltage dividers are gonna pop up everywhere. A lot of our circuits are gonna secretly contain voltage dividers in various places. So getting, getting a good intuitive understanding and practice with different versions of these things is, is uh, it's pretty easy, but it's uh, it's pretty useful for, for a lot of circuits, even circuits where you don't necessarily want to divide voltage, you want to amplify voltage or manipulate voltage with some filter. Often there'll be a secret voltage divider somewhere. It will help. All right, so so diodes and LEDs. I'm not going to talk much about how these these things work. We can uh, I can find you some resources if you're really interested. Uh, uh, separately, but uh, so a diode and a light emitting diode, these are very similar. The, co the component looks like this, just an arrow, a little bar. And there are three, um, see so there are three versions of, of approximations getting better and better for, for diodes. So, so approximation number one, Approximation number one is that diode is a one-way valve. So it lets water flow, lets current flow only in the direction that the arrow is pointed. So um, let me just draw two example circuits here, plus minus. Uh, so whenever you have a diode, you always want to resistor there. So in this circuit, let's let's call this five volts. Uh, give this 10, 10 kilo ohms. Um, in this first approximation, yes, current will flow in this in this circuit, but if I reverse the diode, I still have my 10k five volts. If I reverse the diode and point it the other way, no current will flow. All right, so that's that's current, but again, we current kind of just comes along for the ride. We usually care about voltages. Um, let me ask, what is the voltage here at this point? If we're to measure the voltage here, well, I say that this is something that's not not always obvious to people. If you think about it in the height analogy, we've gone up by five volts. Have we gone down by anything? If there's no current flowing, no. So, so what, what's coming out here is still five volts. So even though there's no current flowing, there's still a voltage output of five volts. And this is this is part of what makes thinking about and measuring voltages slightly less less intuitive than currents. Again, just think of the currents as coming along for the ride, and and you'll be you'll be fine. Um, before I talk about this circuit, let me talk about approximation number two. Is is that it's a one-way valve, but uh, when when current flows, there is still. Um, well, let me say this a different way. When yeah, when current flows, there is still a voltage. drop. Um, and, and the voltage drop depends on the type of diode. So, so normal diodes are about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts um, for silicon, silicon diodes, uh, 1.5 to, I don't know, 2 point something, and I'll call it 2.5 for LEDs. And this depends on what, what they're made of. Uh, and, and current Current only flows. Current flows only 
when you have at least this voltage. So, so here in this circuit, current is flowing, right? Because the diode's pointed in the right direction and the voltage is high enough. Uh, but once current gets, gets going and it's flowing, the voltage drop across this diode is going to be, uh, let's just say it's a silicon diode. If you measure, measure the voltage across the diode here, this is going to be about 0.6 volts. So it's a valve, but it needs enough voltage to get, get going. And once, once it gets going, it, it keeps that, that same voltage drop across it. Uh, so that's approximation number two. Approximation number three is that current I is exponential. This is a better, an even better approximation, which we'll almost never use. Current is proportional to the exponent e to the e to the voltage over some some v naught just to to get the units right. So um, if you were to force a particular voltage across the diode, the current would be exponential in that voltage. And if you were to plot this for reasonable ranges of currents and voltages, what you'll see is that for negative voltages, there's extremely little current and then positive and positive and positive and right around 0.6 volts, this thing really takes off. So this is, this is an exponent, but uh, right around here at 0.6, that's where this thing takes off for a silicon diode. And so it's approximation two is not, is not exact. As I change the voltage um, a little bit, uh, I get vastly different currents. But usually in a circuit like this, or like this, the, the resistor here is limiting the current. And so you're sort of operating around a fixed current. And as long as you're not changing the current much, the voltage doesn't change very much. Right? This is not a good place to have put that. It's really better to put it here. 0.6 volts. So say say you change the, the current between this value and this value, uh, you're going to change the voltage between this value and that value. It's all going to be in some some narrow range. So so this is sort of the most accurate approximation. But almost always when we think about designing circuits, the first thing we'll do is we'll We'll think about approximation number one to plug the diode in the correct orientation and then think about approximation number two and say, okay, if current is actually flowing, then there's some residual voltage across the, the diode. Uh, and basically never in this class will we have to worry about the, the most accurate approximation number three. And, and the problem with approximation number three is that these constants, the constants depend on temperature, the constants depend on what the diode is made of. Um, there's, there's a bunch of things that go in here. You can use diodes as a thermometer by taking advantage of this. I think some of you in modern lab may, may have done something like that. Uh, but, but for this class, you know, just depending on what you want, put it in the one way or the other way by thinking about it as a one-way valve. And then if you're worried about voltages, you know, accurate to the volt or so, which, which usually we, we are, because that's still within our 10%, um, then you have to worry about the voltage drop across the diode. All right, so I talked for a little bit longer than I meant to talk on the first day, but uh, I kind of covered a lot of a lot of things just to make sure that everyone kind of came up to, to be on the equal, equal footing, equal uh, same place. Uh, so let's take a little break. I would, I would encourage you all to get, get your kits out and ready and, uh, and when we come back, I'll, I'll switch to a different camera and I'll show you maybe a few, a few things. Um, if, you're, if you're really itching to go, you can start reading, reading lab number one, which I emailed and, and I uploaded onto Sakai. Uh, and that's basically what you'll be doing for the next few hours. Uh, and I'll keep Zoom on and I'll hopefully answer any questions anyone has unless I happen to step out. <laughs>